Good afternoon and welcome to the 2015 Seegers Lecture on Jurisprudence. Uh, our lecturer this year is Professor Mark Galanter, Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, Professor Galanter has made so many significant and enduring contributions in such a wide range of fields that when you encounter his name in the literature, you may have a difficult time believing that Mark Galanter is just one guy. Uh, this is an incomplete list of places where he has made a substantial showing. Party structure as a limiting condition on legal change, the famous have-nots repeat player article, uh, alternative dispute resolution, legal pluralism, uh, or as he called it, sectoral pluralism, how a legal system or any system can contain substantial internal variation and yet still be a system. Vanishing trials, something that we're going to hear about <coughs> today. Law and religion. Uh, artificial persons, the lawyer joke as a unique medium for studying change in the legal profession. And oh yes, then there's India. <laughs> Professor Galanter is perhaps the leading U.S. commentator uh, on Indian law and the change in Indian legal system. I suppose that what might tie all of this together is a school, the school of law and society, or law and social science, which is basically the use of social science methodology to study law and related legal phenomena. But I think it's clear that the work and the person of Mark Galanter shows that there is a meaningful difference between the mere application of a methodology, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a stable disposition, a habit of blazing <coughs> trails. Uh, Mark has spent his career blazing trails, plunging joyfully, right? <coughs> joy, is a key characteristic of Mark and his work. Plunging joyfully into the wild and making it possible and attractive for other folks to follow. We are honored to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark. start by expressing my gratitude to Bernie, to Dean Lyon, to Melissa Munt, and the Dr. Leiser Law School community for their gracious hospitality that I'm enjoying here. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity that delivering the Seegers Lecture provides to address some matters that have puzzled me. Uh, as an observer of the American legal scene, I'm struck by how much has changed since I got out of law school a long time ago. Don't worry, I'm not going, I'm not going to harangue you about how things were so much better in the good old days. Um, but I want to, want to take this opportunity to examine some prominent changes in our legal system. Uh, and as we attend to our daily Around we, we live through immense changes and sometimes fail to see just how dramatic they are. Uh, and we end up in a place that was literally unimaginable a few decades earlier. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is reflect on how much has changed and how, how limited is our ability to envision the future. Now, I want to begin with a puzzle. On the one hand, we observe what appears to be a pervasive legalization of American life. And I recognize that legalization is an is a ambiguous term because it's, it's one of those words like sanction, 
that seems to mean something and also its opposite. Uh, so legalization can mean something that's no longer illegal. Uh, marijuana gets legalized, etc. Uh, so it's no longer sanctioned or punished or forbidden. Uh, and there are many, many examples that, that provide for that. Uh, but legalization also means to subject something to more regulation. We can say, as marijuana, uh, clearly a whole new set of regulations is, is emerging about its production and sale and use by miners and use by drivers and so forth. Uh, and the net result, we might expect, is going to be not less regulation, but more. Uh, hopefully less violent and destructive uh, than the earlier regulatory regime. But, uh, so, uh, legalization, and, and we can multiply examples, uh, same-sex marriage, for example, is clearly being legalized in, in both senses. It's no longer forbidden, but it promises to be increasingly regulated. Uh, just one little example, uh, opening the door to same-sex divorce. Uh, a condition that's clearly going to involve more regulation than just moving out. Okay, so there's reason to think that in addition to some dramatic instances of legalization in the first permission sense, our society is becoming much more legalized in the second or regulation sense. There are more rules, more lawyers, more spending on things legal. And if we take the presence of lawyers and spending on them as rough indicators of legalization, we can chart a dramatic legalization of American society over the past half century. Now, it's not just that it's begun in the last 50 years, but I just want to focus on a convenient chunk. And uh, I'm going to do that by comparing <coughs> the features of the legal system today uh, with their precursors of 25 years ago and 25 years before that. So I'm going to take uh, not 2010, for convenience I declare to be the present, uh, and we'll look 25 years earlier to 1985 and 25 years before that to 1960. Uh, and to trace these connections, I'm going to present in very summary form some data about changes in legal institutions in their setting. And, and I hope by this exercise to suggest the change in scale, structure, and texture of the legal world, and to get some sense of the direction and pace of change. Um, then I hope to speculate a bit about the possible connections between these changes and the decline of trials. Uh, now these, the, the frequency of trials be, uh, began to fall uh, before the period in question. It's actually been going on in terms of the percentage of things that go to trial. It's been going on for much longer. But the changes since 1960 are so dramatic that I hope you'll indulge me in this foreshortening. How do we measure the, the presence of regulation well, a useful first approximation, of course, is count the lawyers. And there's a very significant increase in lawyers. Even 50 years ago, uh, the, the United States had considerably more lawyers per capita than just about any other country. Uh, and lawyers and the ratio to the national population uh, has been increasing just about everywhere, which suggests that the legalization that we're observing in the U.S. <coughs> It's not peculiar or unusual, uh, but very much the way things seem to be heading quite generally. Uh, so here you can see the number of lawyers uh, in 1960, 85, and 2010. And it's clearly increased much faster than the population. In 1980, uh, I'm sorry, in 1960, there was about one lawyer for every 630 persons. That increased by 1985 to one for every 300 and 
63 persons, and now about one for every 250. So uh, over this 50-year period, lawyers grew about two and a half times as fast as the underlying population. And when we talk about the presence of lawyers, we, we have to consider, too, the changing technology that they wield. A lawyer practicing in 1900 uh, coming, say, to the U.S. In 18, into a law office in 1960 would have found very little that was unfamiliar and baffling in the technology of the 1960 law office. It wasn't notably different than that of the turn of the century, when elevators and telephones and stenography had transformed the law office from that all-male preserve of copyists and spittoons and stuff. Uh, and, and suddenly, law offices had these great multiplied shelves of printed material, law reports, and digests, and citators, and legal encyclopedias like ALR and CJS and so forth. These, these uh, were all there already in 1900. So uh, I think the only time thing that our time traveler might have been surprised coming into the 1960 law office might have been loose leaf services. I mean, really something as small as that. But then abruptly, around 1960, <coughs> two years later maybe, this long period of technological calm ended with an unbroken, mushrooming succession of innovations, photocopying, fax machines, office computers, CD-ROMs, online data services, overnight <coughs> delivery, email, cell phones, uh, laptops, smartphones, uh, access to the World Wide Web, the cloud, etc. And I'm sure there's many more that I'm, I, I don't even know about. Bringing all these changes, uh, coming uh, at, at bringing us uh, electronic <coughs> filing uh, and electronic discovery, nationwide and worldwide law firms, and many, many other innovations that made law practice something very different than it, than it had been earlier. Now, these new technologies enable these more numerous lawyers to produce more product, whatever it is lawyers produce. Uh, some part of that consists of dealing with regulation, producing it, invoking it, conforming to it, working around it. So it seems fair to assume that more lawyers signifies the presence also of more regulatory activity. Uh, unsurprisingly, spending on legal services, which is basically spending on lawyers, consumes a larger portion of our swelling national product. Uh, as you can see in figure two, okay, so this is lawyer. Now, figure two shows us that spending on legal services as a portion of the gross national product, or actually the gross domestic product, uh, and you can see that it starts at little over half a percent in 1960 and grows to uh, about almost three times that by 2010. And of course, this is in a period of tremendous growth of, of the total. Uh, so the legalization that's suggested by these lawyer measures is confirmed, it's introduced by a comparable increase in the quantity of regulation, uh, which it's hard to find a, a measure for that. Uh, use the quantity of, of regulation in the federal <coughs> register. The 82, th oh, that's it, right? <coughs> Back in, in 2010, some 82,000 pages were added to the federal register about six times the amount added back in 1960. Uh, and this growth continues in all administrations. Um, and, and I use this not as a, as a measure of how much regulation there is, but just as an indicator. So something 
giving us a sense of the, the span of that regulatory sea in which all these lawyers are swimming. Uh, finally, as a rough measure of the presence of rules, an investment in enforcement activity, a coercive deployment of legal sanctions, uh, figure four shows us the number of persons confined in prison or jail in each of those years, rising from just 332,000 in 1960, surging to a staggering 1.6 million in 2010, an increase of even greater scale than the massive increases of lawyers and spending on law. So we have lawyers, rules, prisoners, all present in greatly increased quantities. At the same time, one of our emblematic and central legal institutions, the trial, is not present in increased quantities. Instead, it's shrinking. Back in 1936, sort of skipping up, before the enactment of the federal rules of civil procedure, something like 18% of all civil cases in the federal courts ended up in trial. In 1963, uh, 25 years after the enactment of the federal rules, some 11.5% uh, of civil cases reached trial. And now, it's a little more than 1%. So we went, as I said, from, from 18% to 11% to 1%, clearly going in a very different direction than everything else that you could measure in the legal system. And the figures for the state courts, I should say, are more dicey. Uh, the, the first reliable ones we have are really in the mid-1970s. Uh, as in the federal courts, there's been a long decline, slow and steady, in the percentage of cases that were tried. And more recently, say in the past 20 years or so, in both federal and state courts, while virtually everything else continues to grow, the absolute number of trials is shrinking, not just as a percentage, but shrinking absolutely. Now, how can we reconcile the, the, sh the, shrink, the dramatic decline of trials with the increases in laws, regulations, lawyers, spending on law, imposition of punishment, just about any variable that you can come up with is growing and trials are shrinking. Uh, so this, the, the occurrence of this decline is now widely known, at least in legal circles, uh, to uh, people, uh, lawyers at least, I think, have a sense that trials have been a steadily declining portion of dispositions for a long time. Uh, and perhaps some are aware that they're declining. Uh, probably a lot of people are aware they're declining in absolute numbers uh, because it's well known that there are just fewer people around that are familiar and comfortable uh, skilled trial lawyers. Now there's differences in detail from place to place and court to court, topic to topic, but if we step back, the general trend line is apparent. The trial's declining as the thing, once central, defining, characteristic thing that our courts do. And now this this decline is, is mourned by many judges and practitioners and academics, but the turn away from trials is also celebrated by other academics. And joy, judges invite us, advise us to submit to the inevitable. And practitioners and parties voting with their feet, so to speak, have increasingly avoided the trial mode. Now this diminution of trials remains something of a shock since the trial is close to the symbolic core of our legal system. It's enshrined in everyday expressions like the jury's still out on that, a jury of one's peers, one's day in court, etc. And it's enshrined in widespread lay expectations 
uh, I suppose, uh, constantly reinforced by television. The rarity of trials, now something like 1% of cases, 1% of cases disposed of in the federal courts, and something like that in the state courts, remains hidden from the wider public by news reports and Judge Judy and <laughs> fictional portrayals of trials in the media. But the trend lines, as far as we can see, are on a continuing downward course. The, the absolute decline is getting smaller and less regular because there just isn't that much space for further decline. But the, 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 just to give you a sense of the general dimensions of the decline, they're displayed in the following graphs. Can we go back to number five? That's the federal courts. Uh, uh, the top line is, is criminal, and the bottom line is, is civil in terms of percentage of cases going to trial. And uh, uh, you, you can see in the state <coughs> courts, there's some research in the state courts that gives us a nice sense of, of this decline subject by subject. We, And you can see that it's pretty general and across the board that this, this uh, shrinkage. Um, there's differences in time and <coughs> scale from, from court to court, uh, but the cumulative, cumulative evidence of, of the diminishment of trials suggests that these are all the manifestation of some underlying forces uh, it's not just uh, random happening. Uh, I want to mention one more time series that, 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 as far as I know, is the single longest available run of comparable data about trials. Uh, Peter Murray, uh, a researcher in Boston, assembled figures on civil trials in the Massachusetts courts for, at five-year intervals for the whole period from 1925 to 2000. And back in 1925, uh, the Massachusetts Superior Court consists of 32 judges. And in that year, each judge conducted an average of 94 trials. That's two trials a week. Uh, and these were trials that it, it just happened in Massachusetts. The county trials is, is, is a subject in itself. But Massachusetts counted only trials that actually went to verdict. So, sitting two trials that went to verdict each week. By 2000, these 32 Superior Court judges had grown to, nine, to 82. And the average number of trials conducted by those 82 judges, by each of those 82 judges, was seven. So we went from, from, uh, from uh, what, what did I say, uh, 94 trials a year to set. Uh, so clearly, uh, and of course, if we were to adjust for population growth in Massachusetts over the, that 75 year period, it would be more striking. But what this Murray's data displays is not only the different output of the courts, but it points to how different is the job of the contemporary judge compared to his or her predecessors. The, the jury trial activity, and by the way, those were only jury trials happening in Massachusetts. The, the, the jury trial activity was the daily routine of judges in the first quarter of the 20th century has become rather exceptional for their counterparts at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, and Murray, the man who collected this, says, by comparison with previous generations, Lawyers and judges of today are living a legal culture in which trial by jury is more a legend than a reality. Now I want to emphasize what this long-term decline of trials is not. It doesn't mark a decline of legal regulation, nor does it mark a decline in resort to law by claimants or, or rulers, nor does it mark a, dis, a, a decrease in conflict and context. On the contrary, 
we see more regulation, more claiming, more context. For example, again, the legalization of marijuana or the policing of child care, each brings in its train a whole new set of regulations and enforcement practices and perhaps new frontiers of liability as well. But we may get all these mores without getting more trials in our, in our courts. Uh, so, I want to examine a little bit the wider setting of this decline of court trials. Now, it's important to note that in addition to trials, those government institutions that we call courts, there's a, in addition to trials there, there's a considerably larger number of trial-like proceedings located in, at other governmental institutions that are not part of the judicial branch. At the federal level, these range from immigration courts, the Board of Veterans' Appeals, to the Social Security Administration. In, in 2010, the federal courts <coughs> held trials, both civil and criminal, in less than 14,000 cases. The immigration courts <coughs> heard about 10 times as many, 122,000. <coughs> That's only cases with representation and another 164,000 without. The Board of Veterans' Appeals held over 13,000, heard over 13,000 cases, <coughs> and the Social Security Administration's Office of Disability Adjudication and Review heard over 700,000. 700,000 cases over here, uh, uh, 14,000 in the federal court. So, uh, so there's lots of adjudication going on. But it occurs in institutions that enjoy a less distinguished ceremonial pedigree than courts. Absent of robes, elevated benches, honorific titles, deferential retainers, the distinctive etiquette that distinguishes a court from more pedestrian decision-making bodies. So all these boards and commissions and tribunals and office of, some even call courts, but they enjoy none of the institutional charisma that attaches to real courts, staffed by ceremonially complete judges who are a shrinking portion, of course, of the total number of governmental judges and an even smaller fraction of all those who play the role of third-party decision-maker. So, and the latter include the growing band of arbitrators and mediators and other so-called neutrals and the decision makers that reside in the great array of forums within institutions, from universities to organized sports to medical boards and hospitals and so forth. So there's tons of, of many, many locations where there's judging going on done by other people who are not formally recognized as judges. So, if we take the trends in the terms of trials of, in these non-capital C courts, uh, we really know very little about it. It remains largely unexplored. There's little reason to assume that there's a comparable shrinkage there as there is in the, in the ceremonially designated courts. Uh, and it's quite possible the caseload uh, 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 of as well as the power and finality of some or many of these forums is growing rather than shrinking. But whatever is happening in them remains largely invisible, not only to the wider public, but to all but a tiny fraction of the legal community. Indeed, that's part of their appeal <coughs> to certain users. Typically, there's no audience at these trials and media reports are very few. Again, beyond the less, these less august and less visible arenas of uh, areas of litigation and government forms, there's all this adjudication out there in arbitrations and a variety of private courts and tribunals. So, so this whole sector of legal activity, governmental and non-governmental, enjoys very little public visibility 
or academic scrutiny. I think it's fair to say that these trials or trialoids rarely figure in any public discourse about legal norms and practices, even though they are much more frequent than the, what we publicly recognize as trials. So in brief, the story is that our courts uh, have, that, that trials in court have declined, both the society and its economy, the legal profession, and virtually all things legal continue to grow. Well, I don't propose to argue that whether we should celebrate or deplore the decline and diffusion of the trial, but I think it would be surprising if this element of our legal world underwent such profound change all by itself, while well, everything else was going on as before. So my goal today is to suggest some of the other changes that are going on and ask how the decline of trials is related to these other developments. How specifically is it connected to changes in the legal profession and changes in the rule and shape of law in our society? Now, uh, I noted earlier the striking growth in the number of lawyers. Lawyers, not all of them, but many more than earlier, are practicing in much larger units in firms that are organized as a pyramid of partners and associates. Uh, although now that's undergoing some change as well. But without going into that, I would say the profession is increasingly stratified with those who represent individuals generally practicing in smaller units with lower incomes and less prestige than those who represent corporate or governmental entities. Uh, and it's those clients, the corporate and governmental entities, that are consuming an ever-growing share of the legal services pond. So that's one significant change. What else has changed that might explain the decline in court trials? There's a number of competing but intertwined changes, and uh, I will uh, just take a couple of minutes to try and, and suggest uh, some, some of them very briefly. Uh, we, you know, so here are some frequent, my list of frequently proffered accounts of why this change, why, why so few trials. Uh, the first is what I call the better technology of fact-finding story. Uh, and some of you may have run into the work of Professor John Langbein, who argues that the common law trial is a weak and costly fact-finding device. Uh, and once discovery became available, starting with the federal rules in the 1930s, uh, discovery is effectively the displace this inefficient and expensive trial. There's, there's some problems, to, I think, with that explanation. Uh, how come it took 60, 70 years? Oh, why is it continuing to have an increasing effect uh, after all this time? Uh, and so forth. Uh, and, and can it really account for the difference between the, the different rates of shrinkage in trials in, in, different, in different subject matters. Um, and how do we explain the comparable decrease of trials in other common law jurisdictions? And I should have mentioned uh, that this phenomenon of the vanishing trial is not a specifically US thing. You see it in Canada, you see it in Australia, you certainly see it in the UK, but there it was Sort of deliberately uh, engineered as a, as a matter of policy toward the, at about the turn of the past century. Okay, so uh, that's one story. Then there's what we might call the, the changing judicial ideology story. Uh, this is another tape. The, the demise of trials results from marked change in the ideology of judges. And between 1960 and 1985, during my first period, 
uh, it was a real shift in the judicial view of trials, a shift in their in judges' view of what the function of courts was. There were always some judges who were known for pressuring parties to settle, but the generally accepted view was that settlement was a desirable byproduct of the push toward trial, and the judge's job was to move things toward trial, and a lot of the cases would just go away. Uh, in the federal district courts in, 19, in the 1960s, almost half the cases were filed and went away without, without a minute of judicial action. They were filed, and then they disappeared, presumably because in some cases they might have just been abandoned, but mostly it was because the lawyers got together and resolved them. Uh, increasingly, uh, judges uh, have seen settlement as, well, as judges have thought that their job was to manage cases from the moment they arrived in court, uh, judges saw a settlement not as the byproduct of their activities, but as close to the heart of their job description. By the late 1970s, this benign, approving view of negotiation was became the received wisdom among prominent, among many prominent judges. Uh, Chief Justice Hubert Will of the Northern District of Illinois was a favorite speaker at the Federal Judicial Center's uh, uh, yearly workshops for new judges. And how do you learn to be a judge? Uh, well, uh, it's not as difficult as learning to be a lawyer. But, <laughs> but uh, so they would go to Washington, they were brought to Washington for two weeks and told, you know, what being a federal judge is like. And uh, Judge Will and, and his colleagues uh, told their charges that, quote, a fairly negotiated settlement generally yields a better conclusion than a judicial decision. Or, as he sometimes put it, uh, when, when he has to hold the trial, he thinks of it as a failure. So, clearly, big change in the mindset of judges and what they think they should be doing. Uh, a third story might be called the recoil against the sense of demands for an enlarged judicial role, uh, in which courts felt, or many judges felt, they were being asked for things beyond their proper scope. Uh, and judges recoiled from this, uh, or at least a significant section of the legal elite, uh, was very much put off by this, and uh, I guess the most famous uh, proponent of that deal was Chief Justice Warren Berger, who fretted uh, greatly about what he thought of the <coughs> litigation explosion, all kinds of excessive demands being made on the courts to solve all of society's problems, and he, he first organized a very significant conference, this is back in 1976, and then launched an exercise uh, to institute what he called, it was called the Better Way Commission, uh, to a better way to resolve disputes that did not involve many trials. Sort of somewhat related to that, but really coming from a different place, was uh, a uh, uh, what you might call the, the battle against frivolous cases story that centered around uh, uh, lawyers who, lawyers and publicists who were concerned about what they saw as the victimization of defendants and potential defendants, mostly corporate defendants, by claims felt to be frivolous, uh, accumulating, they thought, in a great explosion of litigation in which predatory lawyers and, and misguided judges and biased juries were giving excessive awards to undeserving claimants. 
Uh, and this was dramatized and, and continues today, even in a continuing campaign by the United States Chamber of Commerce to identify what they call judicial hell holes. Uh, a, a scholar named John Landy, uh, as this was getting underway, interviewed a, a, a significant sample of business executives, and he found that about three quarters of them thought that most lawsuits by individuals were, quote, so frivolous that they should never have been brought. So that's another story of people who are worried about frivolous and unjustified litigation. Then finally, one more, uh, one more variant is what we call the ADR is better story. Uh, the rise of this period saw the rise of ADR, its transformation from a set of techniques that were thought appropriate for involved for, for resolving small cases uh, or disputes within a circle of people who, who constantly dealt with one another. And this transformation is neatly marked by the changing name of the ABA committee created in 1977 as, quote, the Special Committee on Resolution of Minor Disputes. Uh, by 1993, all the minor stuff was, was gone and it became a section on dispute resolution. And it gained new visibility and respectability, uh, particularly in the, in the Carter administration's uh, Department of Justice, uh, which encouraged uh, the emergence of uh, the resort to, uh, to ADR processes and the, uh, and the emergence of ADR practitioners as a group <coughs> claiming professional status. Uh, so ADR moved uh, from the periphery to the center uh, along with the notion that a court might have several modalities. Uh, the famous phrase at the time was the multi-door courthouse that would, in the words of one of which proponents match the forum to the fuss, so that that some some skilled uh, diagnostician would sort of look at the, the, the dispute and say, oh, that would be good for mediation, or that would be good for that would be suitable for for uh, uh, for trial or, or whatever. So. Uh, I, I, this is certainly not the place to <coughs> analyze all these different frames, but I want to suggest that there were many, the, the move to, or the embrace of, of these non-trial alternatives came in, in many, different, many different flavors. Now these changes that we uh, observe seem particularly striking in view of the extraordinary prominence of courts in American life with our reliance on litigation as an instrument of governance in a way that it is uh, hardly anywhere or nowhere else. Courts here enjoy a special legitimacy that seems quite resistant to even to widespread appreciation that they're inescapably political institutions. So what we see is not less regard for courts or less recourse to courts, but a shift in their mode of operation. Trials have fallen away, even though more processes, more cases are processed in court. And in place of the trial, there's this array of negotiated outcomes. And where the court does impose an outcome, uh, it's less likely to be after trial, much more likely to be a summary judgment, or the result of some low visibility and typical, un typically unreviewable procedural ruling. So trial has largely been relegated to the less prestigious administrative and private forums, away from the courts with all their symbolic trappings, institutional charisma, and public visibility. So these trials have little or no public visibility. Uh, some of them, 
perhaps have some demonstration effect going forward, uh, but it's likely to be little in the way of addition to the publicly accessible body of precedential learning. Now, to the extent that trials remain in the courts, the prospects for trial, I'm sorry, to the extent that claims remain in the courts, the prospects for trial are on a downward spiral. The lawyers, unaccustomed to the demands of risk of trial, prefer the safety of settlement with the added attraction of being able to tell the client what a good outcome is achieved. At the same time, there's no reason to think that the outpouring of new rules is going to abate. Regulation proliferates, so the discretion and pockets of uncertainty that come with it. And parties who can afford to invest in legal outcomes favorable to them <coughs> are going to continue to do so. This is certainly not, by no means, a new development. Uh, more than a century ago, the most famous criminal defense lawyer of his day, uh, a man named Max Steyer, related that, once, that he once inquired of a prospective juror <coughs> at a trial whether he had any opinion regarding the defendant's guilt or innocence. <coughs> the juror said, I have no doubt that he's guilty. What makes you say that? asked Steyer. And the juror replied, because if he was innocent, he would have engaged a big lawyer like you. <laughs> <laughs> but winning is still the hope, the name of the game, as the late Melvin Belli used to say. But winning hardly ever involves a trial these days. Trials will surely remain with us, but whether they will regain their centrality to the, to the judicial process remains to be seen. Thank you very much.